Okay, and with that, I'll introduce our moderator, Fiona Wilson from the Clinton Climate Initiative. Fiona, if you'd like to come on screen and take it away. Thanks, James. And welcome, everyone. And good morning and good afternoon and good evening are in order. I've got, even just among our panelists, we're really spanning quite a few time zones. Uh, so wherever you're joining from in the world, uh, thanks for making time to join us for this conversation. Um, as, as James mentioned earlier, you can type in the, the chat, which is just to the right, uh, your name and what region you're joining from, maybe what organization, if you like. And I also want to remind you that throughout our discussion today, uh, you can type questions in the, the Q&A function, which is in the middle of the bottom panel of your, your Zoom screen. So feel free to use the chat, but you can also uh, utilize the Q&A section as well. And yeah, we're all really excited to have a, have a discussion today about impacting and ESG for islands and what opportunities those um, topics prevent, present for financing sustainable development in islands. Uh, we've got a really a great group of panelists here and uh, you'll hear a little bit about their work. And then towards the end of uh, this panel, we'll also have a discussion. So again, keep thinking of those good questions. Um, it's really always great to have a lot of um, audience participation. And just to introduce myself, um, my name is Fiona Wilson. I'm the senior program manager for the Clinton Climate Initiatives Islands Energy Program. Um, our work is really energy focused. Uh, we work with governments and utilities in island countries uh, to help transition from reliance on fossil fuels towards um, more renewable energy resources. Uh, so this topic is near and dear to our hearts and um, just chatting with the panelists in advance of today, I've already learned a lot. So I know you'll learn a lot from them as well too. I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, um, Jackie Maradi, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Communications and Corporate Social Responsibility Officer at the Bank of Guam. So Jackie, if you would like to come on camera, great. And you can introduce yourself and your work. Thanks, Jackie. Buenas day from Guam and Sezu Isma'asi, and thank you to all of the organizers. Um, we're going to start off with a brief 60-minute uh, intro and then go on to the presentation. Thank you. Financial illiteracy is among the greatest threats to our islands and collective economies. It knows no discrimination and continues to divide, creating barriers to hopes dreams and opportunities while harming families and plaguing generations. As a local bank, we have a genuine stake in the future of our island's population. We have a saying on our island, Inefa Maulik, which means to strive for harmony and order. We have taken it upon ourselves to restore harmony to our people, and the first step must begin with the conversations and actions that lead up to financial inclusion. Only through financial inclusion can we tear down the walls that have been built through centuries of financial injustice. If we don't stand up for financial inclusion, who will? As islanders, let us ride the tides of change together, because when our communities rise, we rise. Thank you. We ask, why talk about financial illiteracy? And to illustrate, here's a very simple commonly asked question. If you had $100 in savings and the interest rate is 2% per annum, how much would you have after five years? Next slide. Very simply, A. Next slide, please. Financial illiteracy is one of the least understood and discussed topics and has one of the greatest strategic impacts on our communities and our economies. It is where traditional solutions have not worked, not in our schools and not in our financial institutions. And not having effective financial literacy programs is directly interlinked with financial inclusion. But what is financial inclusion? Simply put, having access to financial products delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. But what are the barriers to financial inclusion? 
As you can see, gender and age discrimination are among the highest levels of obstacles that we know of. Research shows that both women and young people face significant barriers to financial inclusion, which result in huge opportunity costs to the global economy and in particular to islands. As women reinvest up to 90% of their income in their families, they are more likely to be financially excluded. They have fewer transaction accounts and also face discriminatory policies restricting their access to finance. Young adults also face little access to financial services and lack important support in their transition into adulthood. Access to saving services encourages asset building and promotes sound money management skills. Lack of trust and financial literacy is also due to non-existent and poor financial literacy availability. This limits people's awareness of financial opportunities and to make informed choices. Also, financial institutions language can be even more intimidating, leaving the excluded even less trusting of institutions. Next slide, please. Moreover, the costs are unaffordable for many. For simple accounts such as savings, they can be prohibitive given the uneven cash flows and low income for many. Hence, the underserved traditionally depend on potentially high cost money service companies. Geographic distances, access to brick and mortar branches is limited in underserved areas, making financial services difficult to obtain. Offering options to these distance barriers is critical. Next slide, please. Erratic and lower than average income levels discourage the ability to save with the underserved begin believing they cannot save even with the smallest of amounts. 30% of the financially excluded believe they don't have enough to open accounts. There is clearly a lack of suitable products and services, more adaptable financial products and streamlined procedures must be offered. Reducing the cost of such access is essential. And national and international policies, oftentimes regulation can be often a hindrance to the establishment of simple accounts, while cybersecurity and money laundering rules can prevent account establishment. What are the key takeaways from this particular lessons that we have been learning? By not innovating, financial institutions are missing a promising opportunity, leaving millions behind who could contribute to a healthy and inclusive economy. Women empowerment and financial independence and control are critical to islands' future. Many islands have crafted policies providing favor to women-owned businesses, giving voice to unsung talent. No tool for development is more effective than for the empowerment of women. Financial education and empowerment. Mm -hmm. Poor financial literacy limits people's capacity to be aware of opportunities, to make educated choices, and take effective action to improve their financial well-being. It is also intrinsically linked to consumer protection. With greater knowledge, people are less prone to fall victim to unscrupulous providers. Scaling up financial literacy involves expanding channels and providing digital and branchless options. Simplifying financial services and making them more affordable can result in broadening access and scaling the offerings of savings accounts is one solution to building financial assets and skills. Branchless and digital banking solutions offer channels to acquire financial assets and financial information so critical for financial inclusion. Without these, mm -hmm. continuing and growing groups of the marginalized are unable to become productive members of our growing society. In closing, we are the solution to breaking this cycle. And as Islanders, if we don't, who will? 
Thank you and Sidhu Asma'asi from Guam. Thank you, Jackie. That was a really fantastic presentation. And actually, I like we're starting off the conversation um, with your introduction because I think financial inclusion is really key to this conversation and something we should be keeping in mind when we speak through all the, the other topics that we'll um, touch on today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Up next, I would like to introduce Mark Lewis from uh, BNP Paribas. He's the chief sustainability strategist. So Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Fiona. And um, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, this afternoon. My background is really uh, 30 years as a finance professional working as a research analyst covering uh, energy markets. And for the last 15 years, I've really been um, covering the overlap between energy markets and climate change and carbon pricing, in particular uh, around the European carbon trading uh, scheme. Um, and latterly, I've been very closely involved with the burgeoning ESG space, uh, particularly in, in Europe. Um, and we at BNP Paribas Asset Management have a very strong focus on ESG. We're integrating it into all of our um, into all of our investment portfolios. But, but what I would like to focus on in the six or seven minutes I have to speak here in this initial um, introduction is um, why I am more confident today, more optimistic today about our ability collectively to confront the problem of climate change than I was 10 years ago uh, and why I get more confident uh, with each day that passes, because I think that's a very, it's a very high level messaging way to frame the discussion that we're all having uh, this afternoon, at least in terms of what I can bring to the conversation. So um, what I, the thesis that I want to lay out for you, if you like, is that um, climate change gets easier uh, to confront politically if the economics are seen to be more favorable. And um, if those of you who, who are on this call, uh, many of you may have been present at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference in 2009, um, and anybody who was at the uh, Copenhagen Climate Change Conference, COP15, in December 2009, I, I think came away from that conference thinking that um, it was, well, I came away thinking, being very pessimistic and thinking that we were going to find it very difficult collectively to uh, confront uh, climate change. Um, six years later, only six years later in Paris, we managed to get the breakthrough global climate change deal. And I think the main reason why we succeeded in Paris where we failed in, um, in Copenhagen was that the dynamics of the economics change, the economics of climate change mitigation improved very significantly. And by the way, they've continued to improve, and I'll come back to that in a moment, continue to improve significantly since uh, the Paris Agreement. But um, sometimes it's easy in all of the discussion and all the detailed analysis that goes forward to miss the really big point. And I think the really big point uh, that can help all of us, and particularly governments who need um, the econog who need to have the econog economic arguments to make to their populations to get the political buy-in to be more ambitious in their climate change targets. And, and it's easier to do that when you have a simple message to get across. And I think for me, having studied um, the economics of energy and the economics of climate change in detail for the last 15 years, the single most important point to make is that the reason that the cost of renewable en energy in general and wind and solar in particular have fallen so much in the last decade um, is really that, that wind and solar are intrinsically deflationary sources of energy, whereas fossil fuels, and if we take the example of oil, just to make the point, are intrinsically inflationary sources of energy. And if governments can understand this, this very simple point, it will make it easier for them to explain to their populations why it now makes sense to invest more strongly than ever in renewable energy capacity and in the infrastructure that will facilitate the build out and the scaling up of renewable energy at the scale we need 
to genuinely confront the problem of climate change. So, so why do I say that fossil fuels are intrinsically inflationary, whereas uh, renewables and in particular wind and solar solar are intrinsically deflationary. Well, it's very simple. If you think about fossil fuels, and let's take the example of oil. Uh, with the oil market, you begin by exploiting the resources that are easiest to access. Um, and by definition, resources that are easiest to access are also the cheapest resources to access. But as you deplete those resources over time, you are forced uh, to move further and further up the cost curve uh, to find new sources of oil to replace the ones that you've already consumed. And therefore, if we look at the history of the last 100 and, uh, nearly 50, 150 years now, the history of the oil industry, we've gone from sticking a pencil in the ground in, in Pennsylvania and in the Arabian desert and seeing the oil come gushing out to developing extremely uh, sophisticated but also extremely expensive uh, technology to uh, explore for oil in the Arctic or underneath the salt deposits uh, on the seabed offshore Brazil. And that costs a lot more money than drilling in the Arabian desert. So the history of the development of the fossil fuel industry is that you move further and further up the cost curve over time. Now, of course, it's true that technology can mitigate the inflationary impact of the geology of uh, fossil fuels. But effectively, what you have with fossil fuels always is a fight between the inflationary impact of the geology and the deflationary mitigating impact of technology. And they're always in a battle. But over time, inevitably, the cost rises. Now, compare that with wind and solar. And you see one very clear and obvious difference. With wind and solar, you don't have to go out and explore for wind and solar energy. You don't have to drill for it and you don't even have to produce it. You simply have to build infrastructure at the in the locations where you already know there is a lot of wind available or a lot of solar irradiation available. And then all you have to do is build the infrastructure to capture that energy. And at the point of delivery, the energy arrives for free. So all of the cost, effectively all of the cost, in developing wind and solar, especially solar resources, is in the infrastructure. Now that's really important because th the point about infrastructure is the more of it you build, the cheaper it gets. That's just simple economies of scale. That's one of the most basic laws of economics that there is. As you build more of it, the cost comes down. On top of that, of course, you get the same technology benefit that you get in other industries that you get in the fossil fuel industries. But in this case, the technology benefit the learning by doing benefit is is working in the same direction as the economies of scale effect. And that's why you've had this very aggressive deflationary uh, impact on the costs of renewables, wind and solar over the last decade and why the cost of solar has fallen from four hundred dollars a megawatt hour 10 years ago to less than fifty dollars a megawatt hour today. Um, of course, we need to build out uh, the uh, energy storage technology that we will need, but we will have the same deflationary impact there because that is also an infrastructure business. Now, um, in conclusion, therefore, I think what we can say is that as this deflationary dynamic of renewable energy becomes better understood, governments will be more and more empowered to commit to net zero targets, as indeed we are seeing, and um, to explain to their populations that over time, this will be not only cleaner energy, more environmentally favorable, better for the local air quality, better for in terms of it, um, local job creation rather than depending on the imports of fossil fuels, um, but also cheaper. It will also be cheaper. So uh, renewable energy really is beneficial in every way you can imagine. We just need to, to marry it to the energy storage technology so that we can uh, deal with the problem of intermittency. But other than that, uh, renewable energy is, is an unqualified good. And this deflationary dynamic is absolutely key to ensuring that we build it out at the scale necessary within the time frame necessary to get to net zero by 2050. And uh, hopefully ahead of the Glasgow COP later this year, more and more governments will make this commitment to net zero by 2050. And if they focus on the economics, they will actually find that that's not only the right thing to do for the planet, it's the smart thing to do for their taxpayers 
and for their energy consumers. So I uh, conclude with that positive message that anybody who is following the energy transition and the last 10 years of it will actually be getting more optimistic about our ability collectively to deal with it. And um, that's the message I would have for any policymakers that might be listening in to the call this afternoon and also to the investors who are looking where to deploy their capital. Thanks, Mark. That's a, another great kickoff to another key uh, aspect of this topic, uh, renewable energy. And I think, you know, I'm already seeing in the, the comments in the chat box that uh, many of us are appreciating that really good explanation of the deflationary versus inflationary aspects of uh, renewable energy versus fossil fuels. So I think we'll definitely have to dig into that more later on in sure. the <laughs> panel discussion. Great. Next up, I'd love to introduce our third panelist, Steve Weinstein, who's the chair of the Bermuda Business Development Agency um, with a plethora of other relevant experience I'm sure he will be telling you about as well, but I'll hand it over to Steve. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And if I can, I'd like to try to share my screen. Um, Oops. Okay. Okay. So, uh, oh, the glories of modern technology. So I, I know we've got people across time zones. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, respectively. And Mark's presentation was a tough one to follow, but uh, I found that extremely inspiring and a real call to action for the carbon transition that we so desperately need. As Fiona mentioned, I am the chair of the Bermuda Business Development Agency, a unique public-private agency in Bermuda, whose mission is to... Steve, sorry, would you mind just putting it in presentation mode? If I can. Bottom right-hand corner, you'll see there's a left, left a little bit. <laughs> that one. Yep. Thank you. How is that? Perfect. Please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Our, our goal at the BDA is to support and foster sustainable, equitable economic growth and prosperity in Bermuda. And in light of the ongoing climate crisis that we face, ESG issues are an important part of our strategy in our engagement efforts to attract investment, entrepreneurs, and businesses to Bermuda. And here we have some of the contact information for the outstanding blue chip staff we have at our blue chip agency. The Bermuda economy, I think, is uh, remarkable and unique and worth a minute if you're not familiar with it. Uh, while Bermuda has vibrant domestic sectors uh, ranging from tourism to actually vertical farming, for example, at the end of the day, the heart of Bermuda's business is international business. We are a global financial hub and a hub known for our extremely high standards of cooperation, transparency, and compliance. Uh, Bermuda is a great place uh, to raise money globally, particularly for tech-enabled business-to-business strategies. It's a terrible place to try to hide money. Uh, Bermuda meets and exceeds all standards for cooperation, transplant and compliance, does public registries. And Bermuda is a, you know, uh, are, is, is a bad market to avoid regulation, but a terrific market to embrace sophisticated regulation, particularly in financial services. We were building on half a century of success, particularly in the risk markets. As a result, IB really is the bedrock of our economy on a direct basis, what we call international business, and which is disproportionately what we call, at the BDA call risk, insurance, reinsurance, captives, insurance linked securities and related businesses and services uh, represent a, more than a quarter of GDP, but an indirect basis as much as 60 or perhaps even 80%. 15,000 of Bermuda's 65,000 residents are professionals engaged in international business, which as I said, is an extremely global proposition not inward looking, but addressing solutions the world over. And in particular, Bermuda over the last half a century has established itself as the global risk transfer, a global capital for reinsurance and related adjacent excess risk markets. 
building on that legacy and our environmental legacy that has, extends over four centuries. Currently, Bermuda is seeking to become the world's climate risk capital, and more on that in just a minute. So, I've already touted a bit our focus on uh, public companies, but our economy is unusually predominated by companies that are listed on global exchanges. The London Exchange, not shown here, and the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. That's a remarkable, this now is a little bit outdated because we had a very successful wave of new entrants and fundraising into existing Bermuda entrants as of the end of the year, an important date in the insurance and reinsurance market cycle. This capital is raised in Bermuda and deployed globally to address solutions, but particularly climate and ESG related uh, needs the world over. And as Mark just illustrated so compellingly, increasingly public companies, which dominate the Bermuda market in many respects, are focused on ESG. And if you are a Bermuda a public company, whether domiciled in London or San Francisco or Singapore, Bermuda, you are hearing ESG pressure from a growing constellation of stakeholders. Uh, you're, importantly, your team, uh, human capital is increasingly focused on this topic, but your investors, your customers, your stakeholders, the governments with which you deal, want to know about your ESG strategy. They want to see that it's uh, aligned with your own uh, uh, medium and long-term sustainability as a firm and aligned with their values, whether it's the government or your human capital or your partners in the community around you. Building upon its own legacy as the world's risk capital, as I mentioned, Bermuda is, has an aspiration to establish itself as the world's climate risk capital. Uh, we are optimistic about this given the scale of the crisis the world faces and our capacity to collaborate with players the world over, building in our strength in the most adjacent vertical, climate-driven natural catastrophe reinsurance. This business was not invented in Bermuda, it dates back a millennium, but it was reinvented in Bermuda at least twice, particularly to bring science to a very old industry. So the, uh, techniques and expertise and track record of understanding how climate risk resides on a financial services balance sheet and how it can be made more affordable through diversification, through tranching, through other techniques, were largely pioneered in Bermuda and pound for pound on a per capita basis, as we say, uh, nowhere is the more talent in the marketplace amongst our regulator and amongst the service sectors for that type of activity than in Bermuda. Um, we also believe that by reaffirming our commitment to being a collaborative partner to solve, reduce, mitigate one of the world's top priorities, that this will reinforce Bermuda's global relevance and appeal to investors, businesses, and capital allocators worldwide, not just in the climate risk sector, but in adjacent sectors. Because again, uh, people, investors, entrepreneurs increasingly want to know how we are all contributing to ESG and not ignoring it. Bermuda is also a terrific place to innovate. I really was inspired by Mark's comments. Uh, we have to invest in those technologies and try to pioneer them. Uh, in my own opinion, one can wonder whether an island economy, an island jurisdiction is ideal to uh, manufacture solar panels, for example. But we can be ideal to beta test new innovations like the ones that Mark just outlined. Uh, this is very much in our minds at Bermuda, but I think for any place that's a prescribed geographic location uh, where data can emerge that's very clean. You know there's no town next door. Uh, you know there are no competing utilities as a general proposition for jurisdictions of this size. The data uh, you can offer to an entrepreneur or startup, beta testing and exciting new technologies and like the ones that Mark were talking about can be ideally you know, uniquely valuable in an island economy. And this is a focus of ours. So if you're on the call and this is something you're interested about, we would urge you to give us a call. So. Finally, it is a consistent theme. Uh, Bermuda uh, has, has been around a long time. It, it, and an attraction for all of its sectors is its, its environmental beauty. Uh, Bermuda has been building on environmental legacy from literally the year after it was settled by Europeans. The first Western hemisphere environmental statute that we found dates back to shortly after Bermuda's strat founding in the first decades of the 17th century. Uh, that stewardship of maintaining our environment, our waters, our terrestrial environment is part of why our island is so beautiful. And as part of the foundation for our capacity to partner and attract people and capital in respect to ESG. So with apologies for my clutchiness on the screen share, I'm delighted to be with you today and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thanks, Steve. I think the slides were worth it in the end. So thanks for sharing with us. I'd next like to introduce Simone Hudson, who holds the position of Assistant Vice President Alternatives and Fund Management at AVP Alternatives and Fund Management. Simone, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. 
So I am Simone Hudson from NCB Capital Markets in Jamaica, and NCB Capital Markets is the investment banking arm of the NCB Financial Group, which is the largest financial institution in Jamaica. And through our 60% stake in Guardian Holdings, we have a presence in 20 plus territories throughout the region. I am the Assistant Vice President at NCB Capital Markets with oversight of alternative investment structured products and off balance sheet fund management. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about impact investing and where we at NCB Capital Markets see opportunities to fill the current financing gap that exists in, in funding the sustainable development goals. Uh, these are these opportunities are mainly being pursued through our alternative investments desk and our alternative investments platform is called Stratos Alternative Funds SCC. And this was established to address the gaps that exist on, on two sides of the, the, the stakeholder spectrum in the capital markets. So there is this, the, the, the supply of patient capital that is needed in the current environment uh, to critical infrastructure and industries within the region. And then on the other end, uh, investors are demanding more attractive investments given the underperformance of traditional asset classes. So let me talk to you a little bit about the financing gaps that exist with, the with funding the sustainable development goals uh, and the COVID impact. Now, we would have been aware of the sustainable development goals uh, long before COVID. So we had thoughts on how we wanted to address uh, poverty reduction, infrastructure development, uh, sustained economic growth, and so on, which are, are critical issues, especially for developing, developing nations. And an assessment would have been made as to the level of financing that would have been required annually uh, to fund these goals. And when that calculation was done and the budget was reviewed, there was a financing gap of around US $2.5 trillion annually. Uh, now, unfortunately, those forecasts did not contem contemplate a COVID scenario, uh, which is a global pandemic that, that sent the world basically in a tailspin. So we're in lockdowns here in Jamaica and, and, and some parts of the region and the world. And we're seeing a retrenchment in consumer spending, investments, and economic growth. Now, as a result of COVID, the financing gap has actually increased by about 70% because we need $1 trillion to, to deal with the effects of COVID. And then another $800 billion is needed to offset the decline in external private resources. So collectively, we need to solve for, for reducing or narrowing that gap. Now, there are a number of unknowns in the current climate, uh, but we know for sure that the governments, especially in the developing markets, uh, had fiscal challenges long before COVID, right? So this has been a known challenge. Uh, the budgetary constraints on the islands um, have been spoken about in many forums. Now, we also know that we have to get private external stakeholders to recognize the long-term benefits of, of this type of investment so that they are fully sold on, on, on the benefits and, and stepping up to the plate in terms of narrowing or closing the gap. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some specific SDG goals. Um, and I would like to zero in on those related to infrastructure development and promoting sustained, inclusive and, and sustainable economic growth. Now we have an infrastructure problem within the region and that looks differently from, from, from country to country, right? So in Jamaica, we have issues related to water and, and sanitation and, and uh, telecoms uh, in Barbados, that might be a similar problem. And then if we hop over to Guyana, then it's a uh, road network and just building out the infrastructure to support uh, the newfound wealth there in Guyana. Uh, but infrastructure development is a major issue on the islands. 
And a study actually showed that economic growth is being severely impacted by, by failure to, to invest in infrastructure. The same study which was conducted, it was actually conducted by the IDP, shows that failure to add new capital stock to the existing infrastructure uh, stock is actually costing uh, the islands in terms of economic growth one percentage point. And this cost rises to about 15 percentage points in foregone economic growth if the gap persists uh, for over 10 years. Now, we know that governments and, and state agencies usually lead the way in shouldering the infrastructure funding burden, uh, but they have been constrained as I said, long before COVID and even now with the COVID impact where the focus for the resources has been on the health sector, um, you, you, you realize that the challenges there have been exacerbated. And given the, the efforts to limit contingent liabilities, many projects will have to be funded without the government guarantees. And so this makes the, the projects a little riskier because we investors in the in the region are usually uh, a, a lot more comfortable with the government guarantees given the government's position on on debt repayment so the challenge here is closing the infrastructure gap in times of tight budgetary constraints uh, let's look at at economic growth and the main drivers of economic growth in the region tourism of course is the lifeblood of a number of islands as it is a significant contributor to GDP and employment. And I know there have been discussions around diversifying the economies to reduce reliance on tourism, uh, but I will probably die of old age and that discussion will be ongoing and tourism will still be a significant contributor to, to our economies. It's where we have a comp competitive advantage. Uh, the fact is, uh, tourism has been one of the hardest hit industries uh, in the pandemic. Some hotels have closed, some are operating on a on, on shoestring budget and at paltry uh, occupancy levels. Uh, one source actually expects that the COVID impact on the region's tourism industry is expected to result in 1.2 million tourism job losses and 27 billion loss in, in tourism GDP. So while their major revenue sources have declined as a result of the restrictions on travel, uh, their expenses still need to be met, um, debt still needs to be repaid. And so there is a need for an increase in creative funding to this particular industry. And this leads me to the fun part of the discussion, what NCB Capital Markets is doing uh, to meet these particular needs and narrowing the financing gap as it relates to these goals. Now, we have always been big on innovation and we have often taken the lead on initiatives to deepen the regional capital markets. And the establishment of our alternative investment platform is in keeping with that. The platform, as I mentioned earlier, is called Stratos Alternative Funds SCC, and it provides captive and flexible finance, financial solutions, typically outside the scope of the commercial banking um, operations to various industries. So Stratos is created as a superstructure. It houses different alternative investment themes. It was already established with a regional infrastructure fund, uh, a Caribbean mezzanine fund. We have an opportunity fund that focuses on distressed opportunities. And recently we launched a tourism response impact portfolio, which we call TRIP. And you are the first to hear about it because that's hot off the press, right? So TRIP is the fourth sleeve on the Stratos and it provides creative financing solution or funding solutions to address specific needs uh, in the industry and particularly those players that would have been severely impacted by COVID. We are already assessing a number of opportunities in the region and we see a number of benefits uh, for the tourism interest as well as investors alike. 
Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, we know that the SDG financing gap has widened and NTB Capital Markets and Stratos is willing to step into the space and channel funding uh, to the SDG related industries because we see the importance of these goals in achieving long-term development. And we invite other, fund, other funders to do the same as well. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. That's um, really interesting to hear what you and your organization are, are working on. And um, I think that the audience and certainly the panelists here, given our involvement in the island sector, have a lot of those topics front and center of our minds now, especially given um, the COVID pandemic that the world has been coping with for over a year now. And I actually want to pose our first question to you, Simone, just because it's top of mind, and I think, again, an urgent question for everyone. Tourism has been so severely uh, impacted um, by the pandemic, and islands are among the communities and the countries that have been most severely impacted by that um, drop off in tourism. Um, you've mentioned over a million job losses um, in the region. I, I think you mean the Caribbean, but you can correct me if I've misunderstood. Um, and this new uh, TRIP fund, I'm, I'm not going to be able to repeat the acronym, so maybe you can <laughs> repeat for us. But I'd love to know how, how you're looking at that challenge specifically and how you think either impact investing and ESG um, innovative financing can um, step in to help, uh, help islands address this problem that's been posed by COVID, recover their tourism sectors, possibly build back their tourism sectors differently, uh, and, and what more you can add to, to the, those questions. I'm, I'm sure you have much to say on the topic. Sure, so, so TRIP, uh, the acronym means Tourism Response Impact Portfolio. And we have created this, this funding source specifically to address the needs of the tourism sector. We are aware that the outlook for that particular sector is, um, I mean, it, it, we, we, we think that there is a recovery inside and some forecasts have put that recovery out to 20, 2022, 2023. Certainly we have had discussions here in the Caribbean region with the various tourism interests about uh, what their outlook for the industry and their businesses are in light of, of the restrictions on travel and the restrictions as it relates to filling the capacity in the hotels, because in Jamaica, they're actually restricted to 70% um, to occupancy now uh, as a result of COVID, right? So we are aware that the revenue flows are not as robust as they used to be. However, we are pretty bullish on the sector. This is an industry that has contributed significantly to economic growth. And we know that there is a recovery inside as the vaccine rollout uh, takes place uh, and as vaccine penetration increases. And so the solution that we intend to provide will have to be bespoke because it will have to address the specific needs of the different players. It will have to be patient. And so there may have to be some reprieve as it relates to the cash flows um, and, and repayment. So we are willing to sit down with the individual players and divide, uh, design a, a tailor-made solution to address those specific needs. Hi, Fiona, this is Jackie. I'd, I'd like to add to that because a, a, as, a, as an island in the Pacific, just last week, we actually had a, a panel that um, uh, hosted several islands, Shargao Island um, from uh, the Philippines, the British Virgin Islands, um, and Palau. And so uh, I, 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 uh, I'm very well reminded of Steve's comment about Bermuda being a beta test area. Here in the Pacific, we call it um, islands are living labs. And I think as we're all trying to recover um, and have the tourism industry stabilize, uh, we're seeing different ways of dealing with that, whether it be heavy emphasis on quarantine, heavy emphasis on vaccine, heavy emphasis on, on uh, testing, um, 
Uh, but a lot of it as well has to do with the sources of um, visitors. For example, here in Guam, where the preponderance of our visitors are coming from Japan, which happens to be, as I heard this morning, less than 1% vaccinated in the general population, and Korea, which is about 2.5%. So um, we're working really hard to get uh, at least 50% of our uh, population vaccinated by about the middle of May to, um, to open with care and with great thought. Uh, because as with you, we are also heavily, heavily reliant on, on the visitor industry. And we have spent a lot of um, uh, resources to uh, make sure that that area is vaccinated. Um, nonetheless, I think with so many um, continuing risks, uh, I don't think a lot of our islands are gonna be willing to play the open and shut game you know, we're open, then we're shut, then we're open, then we're shut um, for much longer. And, and I think that's where a lot of the risks are. And we're trying to go very slowly and methodically and diligently. Uh, but, you know, we're all writing the book. I think in the end, that was the, the whole thing about the panel. We're all writing the book at the same time and we're all making mistakes at the same time. And, and great patience um, is, is really needed because uh, these are our foreign literally foreign waters to us all. Steve, did you have a comment to add on there? Or was it a... Yeah, just uh, just uh, three quick things. In our case, the, uh, the global pandemic also impacted our hospitality sectors by severely impacting business travel. You know, at the end of the day, someone on a flight in a hotel room in a restaurant, regardless of their purposes, uh, drives that sector. As I noted, our economy is so so strongly attached to global business that we were impacted by that. But the pandemic is also a chance for all of us to think about how we can build that better. And uh, whether it's more resilient infrastructure or, or more green approach to tourism, it's an opportunity for, for brand new thinking and for innovations. But I think a lot of both business people and uh, folks in the recreation will think about aligning their recreation with their values in a way that was even more so after the pandemic, it's been an inflection point for us all to encourage bodies on planes, bodies in seats, people in hotels. Something that Bermuda did is launch a one-year residency certificate, uh, which we largely branded as digital nomads. Uh, that was a change for Bermuda and a, a break from aspects of our prior practices and has been wildly successful. Uh, but whether you are you know, dreaming up a, a, a solar panel concept or coding, uh, you know, why not do it from paradise has been our branding. If you'd like information about that program, both to explore it yourselves or to see what Bermuda has done and think about it from your jurisdiction. There's information available on the BDA's website. Awesome, yeah, and I think, you know, at the beginning of uh, COVID, everyone was really aware of this sort of silver lining idea of building back better and, okay, our world has changed, but how can we use that to our advantage and spur positive change in myriad arenas? Um, and so I think this is a great example um, of an area where that might be possible despite some obvious challenges. Another area that uh, comes to mind, you know, from all your presentations is Jackie, when you were mentioning uh, financial inclusion and the flip side of that coin, financial exclusion, that's been a problem long before COVID-19 came on the scene. But I think it's more front and center in everyone's minds now that the pandemic has made it a little bit more obvious. So I'm curious if you can maybe speak to how islands and possibly the global community can use this as an opportunity to better address financial exclusion and, and what tools and techniques you would really like to see us take up. I think when we're looking at financing infrastructure, um, as what's happening in the United States, uh, infrastructure has to include um, you know, digital channels. And I don't, you cannot separate inclusion from access to finance um, through digital and branchless channels. They go together. And so that the ability to finance that kind of growth and making it better and more available and accessible, that's actually happening in, in so many ways. When we close down those schools, 
um, and everybody went uh, went online. You know, it was discovered that the households, particularly in the public schools, only 30 percent of them had access to Wi-Fi. So what do you do with the other 70%? And so what we're doing, and, and, and as you know, Guam is a United States territory. So we are beneficiaries of a good number of these um, stimulus and infrastructural programs that are coming out from the United States. And so um, a lot of the building back better, so to speak, is, is providing access to um, options, digital options, not only for students, uh, but the community uh, for telehealth, for banking, you name it. Um, that's really where those kinds of investments have to focus on. Um, but I think as well, that as well as, as financial literacy and outreach and having um, a more digital way of getting financial literacy out is, is really important. Uh, we have a lot of very passionate and driven people, but the coverage needs to be much greater and it can't be just a one-shot deal. Um, it's constant and it's growing and it's relationships. And in, on Guam, we also have many um, 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 visit neighboring island brothers and sisters who have also migrated here. And so there's also the issue of language. Uh, while English is the official language here on Guam, we have many uh, for whom English is a second language, and that that is a means of infrastructure. Um, language is a means of infrastructure, well, so as well. So you have to also take a look at that. So, digital um, language education certainly um, healthcare is very critical because without adequate healthcare, uh, it's impossible to to reopen and to restabilize any uh, visitor industry. Yeah, that's that's great um, great insight there, and I think um, the technology factor is one that we all, all need to be considering. Um, We've got a lot of questions in the, the Q&A about technology and um, green growth and um, myself working in the energy sector. I'm, I'm biased. I have a lot of questions about that that I'm going to uh, pose to Mark later on. But another really good question that's come through the chat, I just want to ask um, Steve so long. Someone's pointed out that we haven't spent a lot of time focusing on the G of ESG. and I think Steve has some thoughts on that and that, you know, Bermuda might have a unique approach there. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on governance and um, advice, uh, thoughts for other islands where they can emphasize that strength in, in their portfolio. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Fiona. And I, I do have a set of opinions, but again, I'll, I'll couch that in the pretext that Bermuda has the uh, situation where our economy is so disproportionately predominated by global public companies. So uh, as a general proposition, the standards and governments characterized in our market are extremely high because the economy is driven by New York Stock Exchange listed SEC registered companies that have their own business purposes to exceed global standards of governance. But increasingly in this world, I think of interconnectedness, cooperation, uh, global compliance ranging from tax to money laundering to sanctions, it's an opportunity for smaller jurisdictions to show that they are responsible members of the family of leading nations, uh, to be cooperative on the world stage, to look to be partners. All of the strategies, I, I was really inspired by the innovative fundraising Simone and Jackie were sharing with us. It does require that uh, uh, the jurisdictions and participants in the market have access to the world's markets, both for products and for financing. So to you know, embrace leading standards of governance is, uh, is really a value add for jurisdictions of our attributes, uh, in my opinion. And certainly we've uh, tried to enact and execute policies that reflect that. Um, and I will, since you uh, gave me a, a window to, you know, I'll just circle back with one thing on S, which is, which is largely so frequently relates to people and the digital divide that Simone was addressing is such an issue. Bermuda did a great job in the pandemic. Uh, the government embraced science, embraced communications, embraced transparency and would send you messages daily about your testing, your reminders, the availability of vaccines. We have great 5G infrastructure, but you also have to have a phone that's gotta be connected. So there is a divide there, even in Bermuda, and we implemented strategies like just having open sessions that were advertised on the telly. Uh, but you have to find a way to bring people along and keep them included. Uh, if, for, if you're pursuing the knowledge-based strategies that I've been trying to outline too, you have to invest in your own people. For some strategies you need 
serious actuaries and they are in high demand, but that continual reinvesting in your own human capital to bring people along equitably is more important than ever as we think about these ESG driven economic strategies that we've been discussing in the call, or you will just exacerbate a have and have not situation, which I'm sure no one on this call would, would like to see. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So turning to you, Mark, um, I think that your comments on uh, energy technologies have sparked a lot of questions in the, the Q&A and the chat. And one, one question rang tr true for me, even as, as someone who works in the sector. Someone pointed out that um, investment in the green energy economy has become so technology focused and that it's difficult for investors, um, governments, uh, stakeholders that kind of work across the energy, uh, energy sector, it's difficult for everyone to keep up with these technologies. And there's the risk of um, potential investments or projects um, being turned down because the technologies are misunderstood or not understood well enough. Um, and so they're, they're asking, how can we ensure that doesn't happen? But I also want to add to that question and say, even though we have this emphasis on technology and technologies in the energy sector, for example, have such a huge potential impact in progressing energy transition, uh, combating climate change, um, how do we also then ensure that we're also looking at um, the social and, and governance aspects of those investments? So could you offer your, your thoughts on that? Sure, absolutely, with pleasure. And. Um... The, the second dimension to the question is a very important one, and, and it will become increasingly important um, as we now focus on issues such as child labor in the uh, supply chain for some of the rare earth metals that are um, needed for the energy transition. This is a very big problem, obviously, in countries like the Congo, where we uh, source some of these materials for, and that's something that the um, sustainable investment industry is really starting uh, to focus on. Um, and uh, the governance, and I, I take the point that, that Steve and others on, on the panel have made about this is very important as well. So I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that we're only focused on, on, on the E part of this, and, and I can say a bit more on the S and the G in a moment, because if nothing else, the pandemic has really forced the investment industry to, to take the S and the G uh, much more seriously uh, than it ever has in the past. I think I think the reason investors tend to focus more on the E is that it's more quantifiable and, and money is a very quant driven thing. You know, where you can measure something and in particular where you think you can make a return on something, um, money will flow to that, which is why that's the good news, why renewable energy is getting cheaper. It makes sense for investors to be putting uh, their money there. Uh, I'll pick up on the technology point in a moment, but as um, Jackie and Simone and Steve have talked very eloquently about the impact of the pandemic, I, I wanted to to just bring the impact of the pandem pandemic on energy markets into focus, because that's been hugely important. And I think psychologically, again, if one can talk about a silver lining on anything so ghastly as this this pandemic that has ravaged the world over the last uh 15 months but uh, nonetheless one one thing i take away from this in the energy market perspective that has been a positive a net positive is that what happened last year in 2020 was that for the first time ever ever so there's a real uh, benchmark year in the history of the global energy transition wind and solar accounted for more than 100 percent of the increase in the global energy consumption now, this is a hugely significant moment because what that meant, not electricity, by the way, energy, all energy globally, more than 100 percent last year of the increase in energy consumption came from wind and solar. Why did that happen? Well, for the very simple reason that every other source of energy demand saw a decline. Uh, last year saw the biggest ever decline in global oil consumption year on year that we've ever seen, more than three times greater than the previous largest decline, which was in 1980 at the time of the Iranian revolution. So just to put that in perspective, but wind and solar saw an increase. Now, I and, and, and a number of other commentators on energy markets for some time now have been saying at some point during this decade, wind and solar will account for more than 100% of the increase in global energy demand. And at that point, fossil fuels by definition will have peaked. Uh, and, and the metaphor I use is now to talk about 
2020 as the trailer for the full feature film that will be showing across the world over the next two decades. And, and that is as the, ener- the, the full film of the energy transition as it plays out over the next two decades. But last year, that was the trailer. In other words, we've crossed a psychological Rubicon, if you will, where investors now are able to, the penny is dropping. Oh, wait a minute. Wind and solar really are growing very quickly. And if they carry on growing at this speed, they will indeed uh, start to have a very meaningful impact, not just on a small part of the electricity market, but on the global energy system overall. So everything I was saying earlier in my prepared remarks about the deflationary dynamics of renewable energy, when you add that to this point about the very rapid growth and the way that renewable energy very soon will be taking 100% of of the increase in in global energy demand as a matter of course, not just because there's a global pandemic there. And I think within five years, that will be the case. Uh, Wind and solar will every year from then on be taking one. Um, If you marry those two bits of information, the deflationary dynamics and the very high growth rates, what that means in turn is that the entire global energy system is going to be subject to deflationary pressure over the next two, three decades. And what that means in turn is that it's going to be impossible for fossil fuels to remain competitive. And what that means in turn is that investors are going to start voting with their feet and they're going to start reallocating money away from fossil fuels to renewables. And in fact, we saw that last year with the terrible stock market performance of oil companies. Um, so, as I say, money is a very rational thing. And, it, and it, you know, there's a reason why we use this phrase, follow the money. I, I mean, money moves very uh, ra- rationally in response to economic stimulus. Now, uh, on the technology point, I'll come to that in a moment. But I also saw a very interesting uh, comment in the chat box, which somebody from the Philippines had put in there, saying, take the point about deflationary dynamics, but how can we convince governments such as the government of Philippines that this is uh, the sensible thing to do? And I think that's absolutely the right question, because as I say, the challenge here is no longer an economic challenge. The economics are there. They're incontrovertible. You can you can run the numbers. And, and uh, this is now increasingly a consensual view. Um, however, what you have in many economies, and this plays to the governance angle as well, is vested interests who've sunk a lot of money into assets that are no longer economic, but they want to defend the profits that they've been getting from those assets. So actually, it's the it's the unhealthy relationship between um, some governments and uh, some very powerful companies, very powerful lobbies in certain certain countries. And by no means is this restricted to the developing world, by the way. I mean, uh, I saw this happen in Germany 15 years ago. You know, the large utilities were trying to block the development of renewable energy because they had large sunk cases. This is by no means a, a a rich world, poor world kind of division. This, this is human nature everywhere. You look to defend uh, the vested interests you've got. So what we need more than anything else is transparency. And that means accepting the logic of the economics, or as Steve said very eloquently with regard to the pandemic, accepting the logic of the science. I mean, if, if, if you have policy, um, fact-based policy making in any domain, whether it be the energy policy, public health policy, follow the facts, have uh, a transparent, democratic debate about the best way forward. That's the way that, that, that we move in tandem. My point really is the economics now are no longer the obstacle. The, the economics are actually a way to move us forward. Uh, it's the politics that are the big challenge. And in many countries, there is a, a an obvious governance issue between the power that uh, a, a fossil fuel-led um, energy system them has in, in lobbying governments. There's no question about that. I mean, that, that, that's very well understood. Um, in terms of the technology point that um, that was raised, yes, I, I mean, technology um, is moving so quickly that even those of us who are following this uh, in our day jobs, you know, it's my job to follow this on a day-to-day basis, and it can be very overwhelming even if you're paid to follow this 24-7. Um, however, I think you have to remain focused on the big picture. Because no one can be an expert on everything. And I long ago gave up trying to be an expert, even on this small part of the of the industry that I focused on. But what you can do is stay focused on the big picture. And the big picture is moving in the right direction for all of us in terms of 
uh, having a, a healthy future global energy system. As I say, the economics and the technology are now very firmly uh, on our side. Um, and, I, and I think it's really a question of trying to um, simplify these very complex issues and articulate them in a way that governments and more importantly still the general population can understand and in fact i think you know uh, w w if, if you look at the public opinion polling around the world on climate change and on renewable energy uh, you will find an overwhelming level of support for renewable energy um, in in every country in the world really uh, where citizens can see that it's cheaper and cleaner and and gives a uh, a more positive future so um uh, I, I wouldn't get too bogged down by the sometimes daunting complexity of the technological development. Stay focused on the big picture. The big picture is renewable energy is getting cheaper. The, the, the message around clean energy is, is increasingly well understood around the world. And by the way, I'll make one other point. Um, it's not just about uh, climate change. It's about having clean air and breathable air in our big cities and probably in, in the world's uh, islands that's not so much of an issue. But if you're thinking about the countries that really are going to be the countries where the, the, the war on climate change is won or lost, China, India, the big developing countries of, the, uh, of Asia and Africa and Latin America, um, the breathability, literally the breathability of the air in these big cities is now an existential issue. I think there are some studies out there, notably one from the University of Chicago, which says that um, death from uh, dirty air is, is the largest source of early mortality in the world. You, you know, so there are stunning numbers, that, but the, the, the reason that doesn't get picked up on enough is that it's very highly concentrated in a small number of big cities uh, around the world in, in the developing world but um, one of the things of the pandemic and I'll, I'll close with this reflection one of the things about the pandemic that most struck me one of the photos that most struck me was the picture of New Delhi before and after the lockdown and you see these pictures of New Delhi with the smog and you know you're almost struggling for breath just looking at the photograph never mind being in on the ground in the city and then you see the photo of new delhi without the smog because of the lockdown and all of a sudden you can see blue sky um that will leave a psychological trace on the citizens of new delhi and of all the cities around the world that that for the first time during that lockdown were able to see an alternative future um where we have electrified transport and um non non-fossil fuel driven uh, energy uh, energy system. So focus on the big picture, focus on the positive messages. There are a lot of positive messages to get across to governments and populations that can help drive and accelerate this process. That's really the key. Yeah, yeah and I think that's a great point you made, Mark, that the economics of renewables is no longer in question. It's a human and political and social right. task, how to right. navigate right. these complex systems to, to make these investments and make these yeah. projects happen. Um, yeah. And uh, that's reminding me of a point that Simone made earlier. Um, you were speaking about how there's infrastructure projects that need to happen. And because of budget constraints um, and other, uh, yeah, other constraints brought about by COVID-19, especially, although there's other factors as well, um, many governments are not able to provide sovereign guarantees for these projects that still need to be funded. And I know that in the, the Africa region, for many years, it was um, considered a foregone conclusion that you wouldn't be able to finance uh, a power plant, for example, um, without a sovereign guarantee if that country had was considered a credit risk. Um, and so I'm curious what you're seeing in, in the Caribbean region um, in terms of funding these infrastructure projects that might you know, make sense economically, but historically would have required a sovereign guarantee. Are there other sort of innovative financing tools that are being used or other strategies to get around that, uh, what was previously thought of as a requirement? Uh, certainly, and uh, an example, of that is is or 
is 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 NCB's lead on uh, funding or National Water Commission. Uh, and I think that transaction was done a couple of years ago when we entered into discussions with the NWC, um, we knew the challenge of obtaining a sovereign guarantee. And, and we sat down with the principals and we said, okay, um, the, this is what investors are usually um, demanding, right? This project and this utility infrastructure is, is, is weak and the economic benefits today are not as apparent, but we know that in structuring this financial solution for you, uh, we can take this, this, this provider, this utility provider to where it needs to be. And so there were numerous discussions had and we were able to come up with a financing solution uh, without a government guarantee uh, that the investors, the, the local investors appreciated and the offer was oversubscribed. And so, yes, there is the room um, to have those balanced discussions uh, with, the, with the government, with the private sector entities uh, in order to, to, to come up with a bespoke solution that investors will appreciate um, and, and will buy into. Thanks, man. Makes a lot of sense. Another uh, really good question from a, a participant here. Um, I'm wondering if maybe Jackie would want to start off addressing this one. Um, the question is, other than financing, what are the resources or community or, or support that might be missing in island nations that would support sustainable, innovative startups? Um, can you think of any other other resources, not specifically the money itself, but what are we missing here that would make a big change? You know, we're seeing in this small island such a resurgence of innovation and entrepreneurship that is really powering uh, growing new businesses. And we've discussed this, that a lot of the entrepreneurs are very young. They're for the most part untested but they have access to financial services that are not the traditional financial services that used to come from banks. Um, they're on social media and they're selling on social media and they're getting payments for their services and for their products on social media and using um, instruments such as PayPal and Venmo and you name it, all of that. And they're doing very well. The thing is, it's the resources they need is not just that. I think what, what they also need is coaching and mentoring so, so that they learn not only to manage money, but also to manage a business. And it, they're, they're incredibly inspiring and, and they are so driven and so passionate what they do and, and their businesses are sustainable and they have purpose and, and it's all, um, it, it's really interesting to see because they're very young people, but, and I think as a bank, we want to be able to, to partner with these groups, but we also know that not all of them are, um, are going to be successful. I think what's also important is that a lot of these businesses, they start when they're very young. That's why going to the schools and, and giving young adults opportunities to showcase their businesses is such an important thing. We've done that, you know, whether it be at economic forums or at teen expos, and, uh, and we've seen actually in the last few years, a lot of the small companies, you know, grow up, they grow up right before us. And I, and it's, it's human resource, it's volunteering, it's mentoring, it's coaching. Those are the non-dollar resources to invest in growing businesses. Um, things like we offer scholarships for CSR based um, programs that our students can come up with. We offer, you know, um, grants to help young businesses start up. 
those are the kinds of things I think that are going to be really important because, you know, in in America as as in 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 Guam, the small businesses still drive and produce the same not the, the largest number of jobs um, versus the the larger companies. So there's resources are not is are not just money. It's not just energy. It's people. It's it's confidence. It's um, providing a platform from which to launch new businesses and innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's really missing. And, and we like to think that we give our young adults um, that platform from which to, to, to launch new, new ideas. Um, creativity and innovation, I, I haven't seen so much of that in the last, that I have in the last year. And, and it's very, um, it's gratifying to see, but I also need, I know that some discipline has got to, to, to be, um, coached into the development mm. of these businesses. Yeah, interesting. It sounds really powerful and, and agreed. I think it's both, um, it can seem daunting sometimes when you realize there's all these other pieces of the puzzle besides just the money itself, but it's also a huge opportunity and it, yeah, it sounds incredibly powerful. Um, I noticed, Steve, that you mentioned um, an incubator that, that BDA has. I wonder if you can share some of your experiences there and maybe just how you know telling the ESG story for startups or new entrepreneurs can really benefit them. Yeah, thank you for that, Fiona. You know, I was uh, inspired to do that by Jackie's remarks, which I found uh, very resonant, and very inspiring. That there is this wealth of energy and, and human capital in um, in our younger colleagues, and uh, as some part of the puzzle, they'll be financing, but they also desire mentorship and coaching. Uh, so in Bermuda, team came together to form Ignite. I've posted their main link in the comments. And the core there is to provide mentorship and coaching uh, to help prepare people to go to someone like Jackie with their financing proposal, with, a, with polish, with a theme, with the right uh, attributes to try to be successful. And we found that to be quite successful. They also yeah, found benefit from working with each other collaborative in a cohort, that they enter this as a team, they, they support and reinforce each other and find it really energizing. And we've had, as, as startups do, uh, ideas that have uh, uh, not panned down to anything particularly tangible, but success stories ranging from something that looks a lot like Uber in an island context to, to local retail, which of course is something that we need to online strategies. Yeah. Um, something else that we have found in Bermuda in terms of the young is that our capacity, Bermuda is not only the best place in the world to run global businesses, but it's a great place to study the impacts of climate change in the world oceans. And there are uh, a couple science foundations in Bermuda, particularly the Bermuda Institute for Ocean Studies, although there are some others. And the training of young professionals in uh, project management, uh, numeracy, uh, communication skills from uh, uh, activities like that translates really nicely into uh, the financial services sector. But the resources are there to give people opportunities and development that can also translate pretty smoothly into economic uh, opportunities for, for the broader jurisdiction. If I, if I can, can, can speak for what's happening in Guam, we're gonna be opening up um, a maker space uh, that's gonna be somewhat of an incubator as well with particular emphasis on the circular economy here in Guam. Um, and, and I think those are the kinds of things that, that really attract um, a lot of energy from our, 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 our young colleagues, as you say. And Jackie, the physical space we found is healthy because uh, for uh, folks like myself of a certain age to have some place where there is coffee and, uh, <laughs> and a Wi-Fi connection, you know, we can do a lot like this conference over Zoom, but there's also like a yearning to provide some mentorship in person. And the yeah. physical space really uh, encourages contributions from what I'm sure is a really broad network and quality of people who would well be interested in, in participating in that way. Absolutely. I also second that. Uh vote for the coffee and Wi-Fi. So I think you're onto something there. Um, I think a few of you might have a perspective on this question. I'm gonna direct it first to Simone and then Mark, but maybe you all can touch on it. One of the participants has asked, is an investor putting themselves at risk by failing to take account of climate risk? And can failing to properly assess these risks, you know, lead to, to stranded assets and other, you know, issues in, in their investments. Simone, do you have any comments on that question? I, I know that Mark will have a lot to say about that too, but I'd love to hear your, your experience. Oh, I think you're on mute there. 
Oh, Simone, you're you're muted still. Um, All right. oh, there we go. I, that. I was actually responding to another question in the chat. But <laughs> the icon there. I think investors will need to consider all the, the, the factors at play uh, when they're looking at investment opportunities. And certainly, environmental factors are big considering in, 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 in today's world, right? Uh, we, we spoke about the need for, for, for driving investment in, in cleaner energy. And recently, and I say recently, which could mean anywhere from uh, yesterday to a couple of years ago, um, governments would have implemented uh, bans on, on single use plastic, right? So businesses that would have been dependent on those um, if they didn't change their business models would have become obsolete, right? Or obsolete. And so we, we, there is the need for, for you to consider the business models that are taken into consideration these environmental trends, right? And uh, where governments are leaning in terms of uh, uh, climate change and, and, and protection. Uh, to see whether or not these changes could significantly impact the business models and the operations uh, and your, your investment in essence. Thanks, Simon. Mark, would, would you want to add to that from your, your perspective? Yeah, yeah and I, I can put my um, TCFD hat on because I'm a member of the uh, Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, which was set up by Mark Carney when he was um, a director of the, uh, the Financial Stability Board and presided over by Mayor Mike Bloomberg, um, who, as everybody knows, is a, a big promo proponent of uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. And, and, you know, the TCFD was really set up in order to provide uh, the world's financial stakeholders, whether that be literally uh, governments and financial authorities uh, around the world. I mean, that's the purpose of the FSB itself. I mean, the FSB is the closest thing we have to a global financial wa watchdog. Um, so to look for systemic financial risk from climate change uh, and then the risk from climate change uh, in all financial assets across the economy, whether we're talking about um, in insurance companies and the underwriting bills they face, or um, the three kinds of risks uh, that climate change presents to investors and their financial interests. So we talk about the physical risk, which I think is the most intuitively obvious from climate change, and and uh, the physical risk affects obviously island economies are very exposed to that because they're typically in tropical regions with with um, all the severe weather events that go, go with that. Um, but what I spend a lot of my time on is the so-called transition risk. This is the change in the distribution of value across industrial sectors that the uh, response, the policy response and the technology response that we were talking about earlier to climate change is eliciting. And um, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, what you're seeing already uh, so the short answer is yes, investors do need to start taking climate change into account. But what you're already seeing is a massive redistribution of value away from the fossil fuel uh, sector towards the clean energy sector. You can see that, for example, the best way just in a shorthand way to show how that is happening is if you look at a company like you know, Exxon or any of the big oil companies and the, and the multiples, the stock market multiples they're trading on, the price earnings ratio or the EV EBITDA ratio they're trading on, and compare that with the same ratios that clean energy companies are trading on. Look, take a look at Tesla as just one example, you know, trading on an astronomically high um, PE ratio. I'm not going to give a view as to whether or not that's, you know, I'm not here to give investment advice, but but what I'm saying is the stock market is sending a signal uh, to people. And, and the reason that many oil companies, particularly in Europe now, and uh, many auto companies, again, particularly in Europe, are pivoting very quickly now towards renewable energy and electric vehicles is that they can see where the stock market is telling them to, to put their future capital investment, 
right? I mean, if you are the manager of a company and you see that your business model is attracting a stock market stock market multiple multiple of ten times, and a clean energy company is trading on three or four times the multiple that you're trading on, that's a very very strong signal to start switching your capex towards a cleaner model. That's what I mean when I said earlier that. Um, the uh, the energy transition is really forcing a redistribution of value. And then the third uh, uh, manifestation of climate change risk financially is what we call liability or legal risk, which we haven't yet seen on a large scale. But you only have to think of the tobacco industry uh, to see how big a, a problem that could become for certain industries, the fossil fuel industry most notably, um, if investors and other parties, you know, citizens um, start uh, thinking about the need for compensation for the effect of climate change. There are some lawsuits already uh, being brought on this, of course. Um, so this is how, as an investor, you should be worried about climate change. It's going to have a physical impact. The transition itself is going to redistribute value and there is uh, the question of liability risk and at some point global society is gonna is going to want and need uh, some form of compensation for the damage that has been done to the climate i mean just really briefly to to, to that point as well um u.s regulators are um and have been discussing the issue of um, looking at to, to provide banks right. guidance on how do you quantify climate change and climate change risk in our respective portfolios. Um, and right. with that, classification of assets based on climate risk um, could be quite impactful. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Jackie. Of course, uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury Yellen has been pretty clear that where she wants the banking system to go. Uh, the Senate confirmed yesterday President Biden's SEC uh, uh, chair, Barry Gensler, who's also been pretty explicit that he wants to use yeah. the tools at his disposal to require public issuers uh, to be more explicit about their climate risk. Tw 20 years ago, I used to say, if you don't think you're a tech company, then you're on the track to being a tech company because everyone's <laughs> a tech company. And similarly, too, if you are not analyzing your climate risk, you are on the not so slow path to extinction. Uh, right. Whether it's misvaluing your own assets, misaligning your strategy, not understanding the risks of your supply chain, we all have to be aware. So ahead of those regulatory developments, I think, is, is pressure from your investors. I had put that dynamic up of who is asking about it. Five years ago, uh, Mark, as you'll know, investor meetings tended not to address climate. That has right. flipped 100%. Literally 100% yeah. of every meeting goes, I want to hear about your climate strategy because I want to make sure you're going to be resilient. And sustainable right. five or ten years. I plan to deploy capital. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, about, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I was just going to say you, you you made me think there, Steve, of the famous line, the famous Hemingway line about uh, bankruptcy, and uh, you know, uh, the, the fossil fuel industry has been for so long saying this is not a problem and we can deal with it. And of course, there's a famous line in one of the Hemingway stories where a character is asked how he went bankrupt, and he says uh, uh, two ways. Uh, gradually, and then and then, suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think we're reaching that point where, you know, there is such an acceleration of this trend towards uh, clean energy happening now because we've, we've hit the sweet spot on the economics. So you've got this virtuous feedback loop between policy and technology, and that will only accelerate from, from because they feed off each other. And yeah. you've also got investors pushing on the same uh, in, in the same direction. And society, you know, with the Greta Thunberg effect, the Fridays for Future strike, Extinction Rebellion, these are all very powerful grassroots social movements globally that are pushing in the same direction. And of course, uh, with the election of, of, of President Biden and the very clear message he is sending, um, I, I thought somebody made a very good point uh, the other day, and I can say this as a, as a British uh, citizen, um, that in fact, um, the U.S. government at the moment is is doing a better job almost of hosting <laughs> hosting the COP than the U.K. government, because what the U.S. government is doing is putting forward a holistic approach to climate change. Every department is joined up 
on how to approach it. Whereas in the UK, you've got conflicting signals, unfortunately, coming from the Treasury and, 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 and coming from uh, different ministries. So we need that holistic approach. And I think um, the Biden administration, we were all optimistic, but I think, uh, well, I can only speak for myself, but it is surpassing expectations in terms of how seriously it was dealing, it is dealing with this problem and how holistically it is dealing with this problem. And the two very rapid things I'd like to add to supplement Mark there is that, yeah, exactly right, but too frequently we distort uh, market mechanisms by subsidies in particular. It's particularly right. pervasive for extractive carbon strategies. And as an island economy, the, you know, the implicit cost of importing legacy fossil fuels versus relying on self-generating resources that might be at your disposal. We spent, a, we spent time talking about solar and wind. I mean, tidal is a, Interesting, where I, I, again, where I think rapid technology acceleration is going to provide opportunities, but it's hard to do if you keep investing in the past. And, right. Uh, there are also values, particularly for mm -hmm. islands, because investors are so keen to know that not just the company or the, the new idea, but the jurisdiction in which they're doing business is going to be sustainable for 10 years. They really right. want to see your ESG strategy and a commitment to resilient alternative energy sources can be a part of that. And, and I also want to, one final quick plug. Uh, the task force for climate disclosure framework is the one that I personally favor. So, so it, and Mark, of course, is really one of the thought leaders of that. But we so badly need some degree of standardization, which comes with cost because one size fits all requirements are, are tough to do. But for investors, for customers, for prospective employees to be able to do relatively standardized comparisons, whose strategy is relatively more risky. But the standards in the TCFD book, calling for governance and the strategic assessment are really quite powerful. And if you're not familiar with their work, I'd urge you to uh, spend some time with it and think about it about again. Great, great. Thank well, you. We're, we're running over time a little bit. I do just wanna pass it back to Simone and Jackie as we finish to just ask, do you have any final thoughts, you know, outside of the aspects of ESG and impact investing that we're already so familiar with and we know our opportunities, what opportunities might the islands community be missing or have not fully capitalized on. Um, you know, I think energy is a great example that we're all thinking about energy all the time, but do you have any final thoughts you'd wanna leave us with of what areas we, we need to be looking at more and where we can really have more growth and more opportunities? I think islands really need to, to diversify um, their economies. And, and this has been discussed, mm -hmm. you know, ad infinitum, um, but almost near total reliance on, on any one or two businesses is, is just, uh, just such a high risk in addition to, of course, all the, 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 the structural and climate change risks that are occurring. But the diversification has to be dependent not only on where you're located, but the kind of resources you have. And, and oftentimes islands don't have the resources in the traditional sense um, that larger companies have had. So I think that's gonna be a real major thing. How, what and how do we diversify with the existing resources that we have, particularly with regard to human capital? Absolutely. I totally agree with Jackie. I also believe that there is an opportunity to, to increase investment in technology. I mean, we have seen a shift towards digital platforms uh, and, and that has accelerated as a result of COVID. And we think that this is an area that we can really drive innovation um, and innovation across all industries, not only financial, um, but manufacturing as well, as well as tourism, which I spoke, which I spoke to um, earlier. So that is where I see another opportunity, certainly in um, investment in, in technology and digital platforms. Definitely, yeah, I think there's a lot of, a lot to be optimistic about and um, I hope that we can take away some of those uh, reflections on the opportunities uh, that are coming out of this conversation. It's been a, I know it's been a challenging year, but I, I really appreciate how each one of you has been highlighting um, opportunities I hadn't hadn't thought of, and I've learned a lot from each of the panelists today. So I really hope the the audience and the uh, the other participants have um, appreciated as well. We do need to close. We're five minutes over time, so we really thank you for bearing with us. Um, but I also want to remind you that there's a, a networking session that starts in about 25 minutes. 
Um, so I really encourage you all to join. And um, we had really fantastic questions coming from all of you. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one of them, but um, I think in this networking session that's coming up now, you'll have opportunities to continue the discussion. And, and that's really the, the benefit of these kind of forums. So thank you to Island Innovation for organizing and, and hosting. And thanks to all the panelists for joining today. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thanks so much, everyone. It was a really great panel. Bye -bye. See you in 25 minutes at the closing. Bye-bye. Take care.